Tone sound. Well, I, I watched Top Gun the other day. You can tell I got tone. <laughs> I got tone. I know. We ah. actually watched it the other day too. I had, I had seen the original, but it was a long time ago. So Josh and I were like, let's watch it again. We tried. So my kids are, are twelve and eleven. So yeah. we tried to get them to watch the original, and oh. they were into it. They're like, yeah. all right, fighter jets. First love scene with Kelly McGillis. Nope. Done. Done. Out. No. And so, but we took them to the movie because we're like, forget it. Yeah. We want to go. And we were with another couple. And same age as us. So yeah. We're going. And the kids loved it. They're like, that's the best I movie I've ever seen. I have seen the new one. I cannot wait to see it. It's, it's so on good. our list. We're like, when can we go? Well, listen. <laughs> we can't go with a two-year-old, though. I remember though. those days. I, you know them. So em. the last movie I saw in a theater before our f oldest was born was The Hangover. Wow. I don't believe I set foot in a movie theater for like six more years yeah, after that. Yeah, seriously. When, do you, when would you? Yeah. You know? It's it, it, when, when I you, love movie theaters too. Oh, oh I know, ooh, but when you I got a go kid no, who you're is not. that young, we're on the show, by the way. But oh, we're, we're just into it. But so for for those who don't know, this is Laura Rutledge. Hi. Who uh, <laughs> when when I cover games, I always have people from the college newspaper, college TV station come up to me and they say, "How do I how do I get a good job in the in the sports journalism yeah. industry?" And I always say, "You need to be like this person I know named Laura McKeeman." And they're like, who the hell is Laura McKeeman? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, yeah. Laura I wonder Rutledge. that too, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. That means you're an OG. Like, like if you know McKeeman, well, we, that means I've really known you for a long you time, and I appreciate been, you so much. You must have been a freshman at Florida was, when we met. Yeah. Yes, it, back in 2007, and then 2008 was when I started covering football a little bit more for the radio station. Yeah, so we got to talk about that because. We all see you on NFL Live, on SEC Nation. Yeah. Uh, you've been on, on the sidelines at various events. We're going to talk about covering gymnastics because that is how I got my start. Uh, so oh, cool. But, oh, yeah. I oh, know yeah. that. Independent Florida Alligator Gymnastics oh, Beat Writer. 1999? Was it 90, 98? Wow. 98 season. Yeah. No, Ju Judy Markell back in the day, the coach. Pre Pre-Ron DeFane. So yeah. But this is, we're getting deep into the SEC Gymnastics weeds <laughs> here. But, uh, but no, so... Yeah, I was covering Florida for the Tampa Tribune. You were working for the radio station, and you had just gotten there. And, and the story of you getting to University of Florida just fascinates me because you weren't going to college initially mm -hmm. out of high school. What, what were you going to do? <laughs> right. So I, it fascinates me, too, because I'm constantly wondering how I even got to this point. I was going to be a professional ballet dancer, and that was what I had worked on for my entire middle school, high school um, time. And, and I thought that's what I'm going to do. I had gone and studied in China when I was 16 and turned 17 while I was over there, then went to a ballet boarding school in D.C. that's actually a Russian academy. Ballet so. boarding school. I think I've seen that show on Netflix. <laughs> Yeah, you probably have. Um, and it probably wasn't nearly as bad as mine was. But anyway, great times. And then I went back to Orlando for my senior year of high school. I was dancing with the Orlando Ballet and trying to audition for companies. I had a couple contracts, a couple opportunities. And at the very last minute, decided to just go with my acceptance to UF because I realized, wow, I'm not sure if I want to be a core dancer, which would be somebody in the back all the time, right. who would also have to have uh, an extra job to try to make money to even live. So you had to wait tables Pretty much. and then dance. That would be it. By the way, being a professional dancer in any capacity is a full-time job. Oh, one hundred percent. Brutally, physically taxing yes. job. Yes, yes. Thank you for knowing that. And that, and that was it. So I, I really abruptly gave up something that had meant the world to me, and that I thought I was going to end up doing as a career. What? Okay, take me through that decision. Yeah. Where were you? How did you make it? And was it a long decision, or was it kind of a light switch? Like, oh well, this is what I'm doing now. Definitely a light switch moment, but for context, I had been told by my parents, you have to apply for in-state academic scholarship in the state of Florida. We right. lived in Florida, and so I applied to both FSU and UF, and wrote essays that had to do with my time dancing and my time in China and my growth that had happened there. And that's actually why I think I got into Florida, because the essay really? got their attention, oh, yeah. because I don't even know... I had. I had taken the ACT. I'm not even sure my test scores were up to par because my focus was on ballet. Yeah. I ended up getting academic scholarship at the time. Bright Futures was, yep. was a thing. So that's what I was able to go to school on because my parents were not going to pay a full ride to send me to college. And so um, it ended up being 
the very, it was the day before I had to go ahead and say, I'm going to Florida right. or I'm going to yeah, forego. You accept it or you don't, yeah. And I thought, what am I doing? And it was a, a total light switch moment. We had been seeing, this is a weird thing, we had been traveling around doing ballet auditions and my mom and I had been seeing all these gator signs everywhere. And I'm like, mom, I, I know, the universe is telling me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> She's like, please go to college. So that was how it happened. That is amazing. So, I mean, what is it like as a high schooler in China? Oof, yeah. Um, it is unusual. I did Florida virtual school while I was over there. So oh, wow. my, my daily schedule. This is very early vir virtual exactly. school. Exactly. And, and for a while, six, right? yes, and I couldn't even get internet for a while there because it's difficult to do. It, probably easier now. But where I lived, it wasn't some really fancy area at all. So I lived in an apartment and uh, one of my teachers from Orlando had come over there with me. So I had a little bit of supervision from her, but I would do 7 a.m. to noon school in my little room in the apartment, then walk to the Shanghai Theater Academy, which is where I went and did ballet. And I would do that from noon to five. And then I would go back home and then do school again from like five to midnight because of the time difference. Yes. So I had to get time with my teachers <laughs> and they weren't awake at the other time. So um, I look back and I think, wow, you know, as a as a 16 year old, it required a ton of discipline, oh, yeah. but, but also was an indicator of something that has helped me so much in this career because so much of it is based around perfection and mm -hmm. trying to achieve perfection, which is not achievable right. for us human beings. So I think I, I've been conditioned my whole life to sort of shoot for that yeah. and it actually works well on tv and it's reps 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 <laughs> exactly and, and exactly. also you have to shake off a bad one yes because you have yes. another one right now which i'm still not great at but i've gotten better at over the years i it, it's it's amazing to me because when when we met you were doing the campus radio station yeah. so this was wruf Six bucks an hour? Is Six that bucks, the? yeah. And I'm not even sure I always got paid, which was my fault, <laughs> not theirs. Um, but yeah, no, I thought I was making big money. I was like, well, this is great. And then you you started moving. Because what, what I appreciated most about your college sports career was you were willing to do jobs that a lot of other people wouldn't have even thought to do. Yeah. Because you did, you you worked for Rivals.com. Yes. You work, Did you work for Scout, Scout. as well? Scout.com. Okay. And, and you were the one who would be calling the, the recruits, yeah. give me your top five list. And, and it's funny because in my career, I've always covered recruiting. I, I always felt like it's an important part of the, the, yeah, you've been the great ecosystem. Yeah. And so when I got hired at Sports Illustrated, it was as the recruiting writer. And I remember everybody I would, would run into, oh, I heard you got hired at SI, congratulations. What are you gonna be doing there? <laughs> Covering recruiting and they'd be like, oh. <laughs> I know. And, and, but, and I, so That's I always thought true. about when, when you were doing that stuff, it was not, I'm here holding the microphone mm -hmm. and you're talking. It is, I am doing stories on you guys. Yeah. I need to know where you're going. I need to know who you're visiting this week. And it was real shoe leather reporting. Mm. And how much did that kind of inform what you do now, what you, what you wind up doing on the sideline? I mean, some of the, the stuff you've got to do. I always talk to people who work sidelines. It, it, the, the, it baffles me how you can, in 29 seconds, do an entire interview. Yeah, that um, we can get to that because yeah. that's a, a skill set that I think is important and one that I'm constantly trying to wire my brain to remember how to do when I've done this other stuff. But w when it goes back to the recruiting side of things, the way that that happened was Steve Russell, who is still at WRUF. Yeah, he's, he does a show. <laughs> We're going to eat some lunch and talk some sports. Exactly. Yep. And he was so he was so impactful to me at that time he said listen if you're going to make it in this you need a niche he said you're not going to just be like everybody else yeah. and make it so you need to find your niche and i realized that at that time you know in the 2008 to 2010 range college football recruiting was booming yes. and people were really becoming interested people were paying for it on the yes. internet this is one of yeah, at the time you know newspapers couldn't fa figure out how to monetize any coverage right. on the internet but recruiting sites had it down pat they were killing it and so people were looking for reporters in that in that world I realized there wasn't much of a female presence there it's yeah. more of the scouting side of football so I, I was teaching myself from the ground up basically yeah. and, and the way that I learned was going up and down the state I would drive up and down the state and I would go to these seven on seven camps yep. and I would talk to the coaches and talk to the players and learn you know what made this guy the a better fit fire in the South Florida Ex Express oh my goodness team Ex Tampa you know, Bay and all of it and, yeah. and some of the some of the things I did during that time are probably not advisable I, I would drive I would go to see high school football, yep. then drive all night back to Gainesville sometimes, depending on where I had gone. Yeah. I would stop in a 
car dealership to sleep for a little bit because I Security. figured no one would cars? see right and yeah. no one would suspect a st a parked car in a car dealership like it wouldn't be safe to really park in a gas station it probably wasn't right. safe to park You're in not a doing a rest there but yeah but that's what it that's what it took because I knew if I was going to get there it was going to have to be you know just almost putting in those hours and and I felt like I needed the experience it, I needed to keep learning it is amazing I hadn't thought about this before you just told me that story but how many of us in this business have those all night driving stories Ooh, from, scary. from early on in our career? Because right. you had to. You had to. You couldn't stay in a hotel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you had no. to get back. And you by the way, who's it. paying for the hotel? Exactly. Right. I, I was yeah. basically working for free, which yeah. was uh, a part of the Thank whole. Thank goodness gas was like $1.25 <laughs> a gallon. I know. Back then it was. <laughs> back in our day. Yeah, no. That's what uh, I, I, so I had a Toyota Corolla that, that got me through college. And I, yeah. I remember my first car, my first job was covering Tennessee for the Chattanooga Times Free Press. I bought a new Honda Accord. Oh, wow. And so my, my now wife, who was my fiance at the time, was still in Gainesville finishing up her undergrad, and I'm in Knoxville. I put 49,000 miles wow. on that car in the first 11 months. Wow. 49,000 miles. That was it, though. Yeah. I, I was getting so many parking tickets on campus because I'd try to go to class, <laughs> and then I would have to go and either do the radio right. show. I, I hosted the yeah. cheap seats on WRUF or, you know, go do an interview or something yeah. like that. I'm like, I've got nowhere to park my car. And I swear <laughs> they started just seeking out my car. They're like, oh, she's back again. Oh, Let's you, get her. You, UPD. <laughs> it was so P bad. Now, everybody <laughs> who went to a large public university has their parking cop oh, yeah. stories. But I feel like it, at UF, it is, it's a special brand of hell. It is. Like, I, I remember it's getting, extra. I remember getting a couple toward the end of my time as a student there. Yeah. And I remember walking in, and I said, what if I don't pay this? What are you going to mm. do? I'm about to graduate. And they're like, we won't give you your degree. You won't get your degree. <laughs> I was like, oh. I found that out, too. I was here's, like, mm. here's your $60. <laughs> yep, I will be paying these, <laughs> these tickets. But, you know, you brought up a really good point about the unique skill of being on the sideline. Yeah. And, and that was something that I was able to sort of hone during that time, too. I did a lot of Internet broadcasts mm -hmm. on, of high school football oh, games. Yeah. And so, so nobody, the, yeah. the great thing was nobody could actually see them or find them, right. which was amazing considering how poorly I was doing. And in fact, the very first game, they're going to pay me $300. They came to give me the check afterward, and I said, I don't even think I can accept this because I was so bad. Wow. I, I, I was so hard on myself. Yeah. I felt like it was awful. But sideline reporting, you have to get reps. I, in order to understand what you're seeing on the sideline, understand what works, figure out how to get in really fast and get back out, yeah. do the, the interviews where the coach is running. they're not going to give you any time. Even no. if you, you say, I've got something, I saw – that this 15 guy was seconds. By the train. Get 15 it in. Fifteen seconds. Maybe, maybe a little bit more if you're coming out of a commercial break. Yeah. But in, and how do you lead with a headline and write in your head? Because that's what you're doing essentially. Exactly. You're writing it ahead of time and turning it right yes, back the around. Yes, the Associated Press in, inverted it. pyramid, but <laughs> exactly. in 15 seconds. That's it. Yeah. yeah. That that is that is crazy. So you you get out of college now. I, I'm not even going to get into the the pageant. So I didn't know you were Miss Florida till I'd known you for like five years I you know <laughs> that that one gets brushed over which is all good yeah. <laughs> is it, like, it was accidental you anyway it up. you never mentioned it and it was like it, it, it was, I it was, was like, wait Laura it was the, truly an the accident recruiting writer is exactly Miss Florida? it only happened because I was trying to win scholarship money because yeah. I needed extra money to to keep trying to help my parents you know pay everything off and yeah. and I won I ended up over my time in the Miss America system winning about forty thousand dollars so wow. it's great yeah yeah i was gonna say mom and dad probably i know they're like okay that works <laughs> and, and now you and, and you started off but not going into sports you, when you showed up at the radio station oh, that yeah. was the job that was open right i thought i grew up on npr mm -hmm. i loved car talk i listened to garrison keeler growing up <laughs> Oh, so you want to talk like this, like we're on all things exactly. considered. <laughs> all and things I, considered, I, here I am. I remember the first time I was on NPR, the, the host comes on, am I popping my peas? <laughs> And I'm like, like, do you yeah. talk like that all the time? Or I thought that was just for the air. I really <laughs> do pop my peas. Um, but so I thought, well, surely they'll have something open on the news side. And, yeah. and I love storytelling. And I, I wanted to do something media related, I thought. Although I had no idea what I wanted to do because I thought I wanted to be a ballerina. And they said, well, we have an opening and it's in sports. <laughs> and I thought, I, I said, yeah, I'll take it. And then I thought, well, golly, I'm not really sure what I know about sports. So this is going to be interesting. Oh, but it, <laughs> it's crazy. Cause, uh, when I was in school, that was what Erin Andrews was doing. She yeah. was at WRUF, and, and she had the big full-size tape recorder recorder yeah. with the full-size mic on it that she's lugging out to practice That's every great. day. Now, But Erin grew up in it because her dad was, right. a, was a TV reporter. You and I, 
we came in not knowing anybody, not knowing how any of this Holy stuff worked. Yes. Like <laughs> I, that, that's the part I thought was the scariest as a student. Like, yeah. I don't know how any of this, like who, how do you get your job? How do you do any right. of this? You feel so lost. You feel so ill-equipped all the time. Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why, and you've been so great about this too. I mean, you were so great to me during that time, just being a kind face and, and not being demeaning to we me. We needed somebody else to throw the football with us. Well, We're true. Me, right. me, and, me and Lindsay Jones and, uh, <laughs> and Dave know. Curtis, who used to work for the Sporting News. And, but and, yeah. that was it. I mean, you have extended helping hands. To me, I feel like that that cannot be done enough because I remember and it's it's no shot at anybody I just remember feeling so lost and yes. feeling like who do I go to who do I ask not knowing the business because we didn't grow up in it that way yeah. understanding TV I mean it's a it's a beast all in a, of itself it was one of the reasons why I didn't want to do TV I thought I'll just do radio and I'll write articles which is what I was doing yeah. up until the the latter part of college I, I didn't get an opportunity on TV and didn't do live TV until spring of my senior year Wow and yeah. then, but the first was the first job CNN. The first job was the Tampa Bay Rays pre and post game oh, reporter, right. okay. which happened uh, kind of randomly. I I had been beating everybody's door down for an internship. Could never get an internship with ESPN, Fox, ABC, any of those places. So it, it was actually great because I got a ton of real experience at smaller places. Yeah. But finally, Fox Sports Florida let me come in and do a summer internship, summer of my junior year. So going into my senior year. And all I did the whole time was copy DVDs. And I thought, what a waste of time. I sat there and ate Mike and Ikes and copied <laughs> DVDs. So then they, they were looking for somebody because they had a contract issue with their reporter who was going to be doing their pre and post right. game stuff. And they said, oh, didn't you want to be on air? And I'm like, well, yeah, I do. And, and, and they said, well, you worked really hard. I, I wrote a bunch of position previews for Florida and Florida State nice. football during that time and said, you have no content on your website. So why don't you put these on there? If you don't want to, that's all good. I'm going to write them anyway. When I got to like the Florida State DBs and the uh, the Florida special teams, I thought, why did I agree to do this? This but is like <laughs> latter day must champ era. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. early Jimbo rough. Fisher. Yeah. Um, but I did that, and and I guess it made an impression on somebody, and they said, oh yeah, we'll put you on TV. Now, little did they know, I didn't even know what an IFB was. I'm, I'm sitting the out there. That's thing that goes in your ear. Goes in your ear and yeah. You know, people think it tells us what to say. It doesn't. Yeah. Uh, it actually counts us nope. in and out. It, well, and. and it, it, <laughs> allows someone to annoy you while you're trying to while talk. While you're trying to talk, yeah. they're talking to you. But I, I showed up on opening day at the Ray Stadium. I was still in college, and so I would travel back and forth from Gainesville to Tampa Bay to do those home games. Oh, the trops at the end of the world. Who <laughs> that trop? <laughs> not I know. made that drive. I'll tell you it what. Is, <laughs> but, but, that, but that is a great lesson for anybody, yeah. but especially people in our business. And I, I try to explain this to, to younger people. Do work that you are not assigned. Mm that no one asked you to Amen. do because people will notice that. And sometimes like what you, what you told them, you've got nothing on your website. You need something. Yeah. Here's something. Identifying a need and then not saying, Hey, you've got this problem. Good luck fixing it. Yeah. Saying I'm going to fix it right. for you. Right. Here's I've already done this. <laughs> right. You, They're here. I took the, and then, and then they throw you on the air. That's, that's the best part. The, Wild. There's so much seat of the pants yes. that, that goes on. Yes. And that's what, so, I was, I was terrified. I, I, one quick funny story. Yeah, yeah. If you look back at the photo of that day, I, I had a pink shirt on. I had pit stains down, nervous oh. sweat pit stains, like down to my rib cage. I could not. Awful. I I'm like, be, what is going on here? I'd be like, no, so turn bad. the camera off. I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> I should have said that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was at SI for, for four years before they let me write an inside the book yeah. magazine feature. Wow. And I couldn't just couldn't figure out how to break through. Well, what happened was there was a story that I had that I was going to write for the website. Yeah. It was about the Sabinization of college football, how everybody was mm. trying to copy what Nick Saban was. This was back in 2012 when that what story hadn't been written 50 times. Right. But something fell through. Somebody's feature fell through, and they called me, and they said, can you get this feature in six days from now? Oh, my goodness. Oh, by the way, you're going to need to talk to Nick Saban. I was in West Virginia at the time when they wow. called. And I, so I called – I believe Jeff Purinson was still the, the sports yeah. information guy at, at Alabama. Or maybe Josh Maxson had, had taken over. But I said, I said, if he can give me eight minutes <laughs> at any point, any time this week, I will, I'm I will on gladly standby. take it. And <laughs> right. so they're like, hold on, hold on, hold on. And they get back to me later in the day. You have 12 minutes wow. on Wednesday. Get to Tuscaloosa on Wednesday. Wow. And so Ooh, I, I just got chills. I got, I got the interview. End up uh, ha was going to Tallahassee that Sunday anyway mm -hmm. to talk to Jimbo Fisher, obviously. 
uh, we know well now, former oh, yeah. Nick Saban mm -hmm. assistant. Yep, yep, it's yep. a little, little more has come out about that. <laughs> but, but so I, I talk to Jimbo. I go sit down at this stir fry place in Tallahassee. Like it's funny. I always remember the restaurant. I, I, I wrote my favorite stories at. Yeah. So, wow. Well, so shout out to One Fresh on Monroe. Uh, there you go. <laughs> sat there and and hacked this thing out for like six hours. The, the people at One Fresh oh. were like, "Who's this guy getting this all these refills?" Leave? <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> but but so that story goes in. It, it's mm -hmm. in the magazine. And all of a sudden, they're like, hey, well, now what are you doing this week? I'm like, what wow. do you mean? You didn't want to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yep. but yeah, if you, if you show takes. up in a pinch mm -hmm. when they need you, mm -hmm. boom, you're in. And there are so many times when you have the urge to say no. You have the urge to yeah. say, let me give in to the anxiety. I have that I pit feel. stains. I can't do I this. I have pit stains. <laughs> I am freaked out. I don't even know what an IFB is. I was literally Googling IFB like on my flip phone <laughs> right. trying to figure out what under the sun they're talking about. And, and, you look back and you say, that could have been a major, it was a sink or swim it moment. It could have been boom goes I the dynamite. I could have sunk and I could have boom goes the dynamite big time. Sure. And I've had some boom goes the dynamite things that thank goodness have not um, found public air. Uh, but, but you look back and you say, you make that decision in that moment to say, I'm going to try, I'm going to do this. I'm going to figure yep. it out. And somehow I'm going to be prepared and yep. somehow I'm going to, and I still feel like, I mean, I still feel I have a long way to go, but even at this level of big time shows on ESPN, I am still figuring it out every single day. And there's still some unexpected thing every day on live TV that I couldn't have never I been prepared for. I think you've done a really good job of not letting yourself get pigeonholed. Cause I think yeah, people you. get, to, Oh, that they do this sport. They do right. this role in this sport. You've, you know, you've done Get Up. You've you've mm -hmm. you've hosted a live show with with SEC Nation. Yes. You host NFL Live, and and I think the NFL Live part of it, I think, is the most impressive thing because you can't say this because you work for ESPN. I <laughs> but I will say it. The previous iteration of that show was boring as hell, <laughs> and the the version you guys do with you and Mina and Ryan Clark and, and Spears comes on and Orlovsky yeah. comes on, like you've you've taken a format that was not working, yeah, and now. When, when there's a big story in the NFL, I turn the show on because I mm. want to hear what you guys have to say. Thank you. That okay. means a lot to me. I, I think I think when you look back like on that group coming together, the, the main key there, and you know this so well yeah. being in this business, is just we, we legitimately love each other. Yeah. We, we are family. And, and I think for us, being able to work <laughs> yeah. with the people that we love and that we want to talk football with anyway has been great but it wasn't without its challenges because this whole thing happens right in the height COVID. of the pandemic yeah. we thought we were all going to be together they're like hey by the way you're all going to zoom in and try to do <sighs> this show and laura is going to be the only one in studio and i'm like wow so this is not going to work but yet another one of those times where you say somehow we've got to make this work i have no other choice got to make it work and, and when you do <laughs> finally do get together you find out that dan orlovsky is a pr complete freak when it comes oh to goodness. food he's so weird what okay have you seen his red wine stuff now now he says no. he puts ice in his red oh, wine yes, I which i that. have witnessed and it made me and i'm not i'm not some hoity-toity person you right. know me right but come on man like we're not putting ice in our red wine what are we doing like it's it's ridiculous now look it, if you're not in the financial position to have the wine fridge and look <laughs> you can buy a wine fridge for like 150 bucks. or you could put it yeah. in your fridge you can put it in your fridge <laughs> and for a little while and you want to get your reds down to like the, the low the yeah. upper 50s yeah yeah but yeah. no not an ice cube yeah but that's not the worst but thing the i mean his, thing his, is weird the too. cookies thing he won't eat a chocolate chip cookie uh oh, he thinks they're bad he won't psychopath. eat i mean honestly he orders in the espn cafeteria plain chicken chopped up and he will occasionally do a cocktail sauce that's like ketchup and ranch. And he'll just do the tiniest little dip because, God forbid, the dip has too many calories on it. And, you know, and oh, I mean, hey, listen, you're as, a healthy guy. As a calorie but, counter now, yeah, <laughs> I, but, but listen, I got you, and you, and you've done amazing yep. work with, with being in this great of shape. But his stuff is just weird. It, it, is, it <laughs> yeah. just doesn't even make sense. Yeah, he see, he doesn't do like that. a flavor, and but that's the problem. That's what my wife and I started this calorie counting thing together, and yeah. we made a pledge when we did it. Like, we're not going to be those people. Yeah. We're not going to be like, we brought our own food to the party because <laughs> we can't eat any of this slop. <laughs> we're not doing that. We are going to yeah. eat normal stuff, and we will just try to moderate it yes. and, then, and, then, and hopefully live a nice, normal life. But, yeah, that, that the Orlowski thing fascinates me. I, He's amazing, though. I mean, one of the most prepared, one of the most yep. interesting football minds I've ever been well, around. And, and that's why I, I want to have him on because I think he does such a great job of translating football to English. Absolutely. And it's a, it's a special skill. Uh -huh. and, and for people who played it at, as, a, at a, as high a level as he did, yeah. 
it's it's great. I mean, and that's what that's what the lightning bolt that, that your bosses are looking for when they hire mm -hmm. those ex athletes mm -hmm. is can this person translate? Mm -hmm. And he really does. He's taught me so much as as a fan of the game who yeah. I, I consume so much football. I legitimately watch games differently because of some of the things that he's taught. Oh, sure. and, and, and he's teaching to anyone who watches him. It, yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. So much fun to watch a live game with him, too. Well, it, yeah, because I love when he puts out the videos when he's like, okay, watch this safety yes. right here. Yeah. And, 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 then, and then goes through all the machinations of why, because this safety did this one right. thing five seconds before all the stuff happened, the quarterback did this. Exactly. And it, it's, it's, it's awesome. Now, Another one of your coworkers, and, and, and another role that you filled into, and then you were headed for megastardom, so you, you, <laughs> you, it was a brief one. But you were a co-host with Paul Feinbaum, briefly. My guy. And that show, I, I just, first of all, I, I think Paul recognizes he has now completely adopted Howard Stern's strategy. <laughs> Informative yes. interviews, let the callers be crazy. Like, Because yeah. I remember Paul when he was the fire-breathing newspaper columnist, mm -hmm. let's get every coach fired, that kind of guy. He's, hard, he's, he's that guy on Get Up, but he's rarely that guy anymore on his show. Yeah, 100%. You're right. I mean, he's embraced, I think, his role on, on SEC Network, which is certainly to be an information show throughout the day. And, and what an incredible thing that he's hosting this show four hours every single day. I don't know how. It's a long time. Yes. Uh, and I also think, and, and I, obviously Paul is one of my favorite people, but to watch someone be as humble as he is with this, I mean, he, he could have a really huge ego, and I'm sure there are some people out there that think he does. Watch him. Yeah. He steps back. He lets the callers be the stars. He lets his interview subjects Absolutely. be the stars. He asks short, succinct questions and lets people talk and lets them tell their stories. But you and know his trick, it's right? It's been so good. You know his trick. I think I do, when, but what do you he, think it is? When he's interviewing you, <laughs> he will let you finish your answer. Yep. And then he will pause a beat before he asks the next question. Because if you've never been on the radio, if you've never been on television, right. you don't understand how long a second and a half or two feels seconds like an of silence feels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so your natural instinct when he pauses is, I must say something else. And that's how he gets you to say something stupid. And then you look back <laughs> and say, I was not planning on ever saying that. Why did I say that? Where did that come from? <laughs> yes. What is that? I know. I end up just trying to ask him a question when he starts doing that to me. Oh, yeah. But th that's like... It, that's because he knows I, I will do that to him. But, you know, he's amazing. He, he's been another one who has been such a, a generous person. He, it's the Paul Feinbaum show. He didn't need a co-host. He let me come on that show and spend time with him and talk to the callers and learn from him. And it was really a launching point in my career. So I imagine when you decided, okay, I've been training to be a ballerina my whole life, and now I'm not going to do that anymore, <laughs> that none of this was in your mind. No. <laughs> but but now that all of this has happened, yeah. What's next? I mean, what 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 do you dream of doing now? Because you've you've done so many different things at ESPN, yeah. it seems like you're willing to do any role that they're gonna throw at you. What what like if you have a bucket list of things you'd like to do down the road, what what are they? Yeah, I. I struggle with this a little bit because I'm so shocked by what I'm already doing and and it's funny because I'm not great at stopping and smelling any roses <laughs> yeah. or, or anything like that but I do try to and and lately especially especially after having my daughter I try to really stay present in what I'm doing now yeah. and being thankful for it but not the best game picker by the way no uh, she like here's the reality 14 and 3 that kid last season like how <laughs> everyone's like did you tell her what to pick I'm like if we had then yeah she wouldn't have had that good of a record like it's insane I mean, did she get offered any jobs by any sports books or, or people will tweet me all the time saying that that she has made them a lot of money and so I'm always like uh, should I be trying to get her paid here my but two no, year old runs yet. a town service <laughs> <laughs> yeah just let us know on the side um, but anyway what I do think my goals are down the road are, are to continue to have one foot in college football and one foot in the NFL and I think the value of being in both sports is is so so 
incredible for me because they all connect and exactly. <laughs> I end up looking back and saying I've known all these players I mean yeah. if Bryce Young is going to be a talented NFL quarterback oh, I yeah. will have covered his college career you yeah. know and, the, and the, it's it's so beneficial so I think my other main thing that I love is live event hosting so yeah. anything that's going to be that is really important to me I'd love down the road and it will be a while because Greeny's going to be doing it for a while but I'd love to host the draft I would love to continue to expand my portfolio of big event hosting that, and, would, be, um, that would be fun hosting the draft, oh my goodness I can't even imagine it would be so much fun I love the draft the draft's my favorite well event. now you have so many broadcasts of the draft you might you right? might break in on on one and then move move to the yeah others. maybe Is, that's what needs now, to happen now Greeny's got to get tired at some point though like yeah he only, does a lot you have guy. so many jobs <laughs> I mean, you have a lot of jobs, at it. but right. he's got more. He does, <laughs> and, and he's great at all of them, and he's worked so hard to get to this point. And I tell you what, I mean, you think about – People could get to that point and rest on their laurels. Instead, he is maniacal about his prep still every single day and puts in incredible effort. Uh, that's hard to do. Yeah, I, I'm just – I'm fascinated by somebody who can move from one world to the other and because it is hard to sound educated about any one thing, much right. less – Especially now with fans knowing as much as they know. Oh, yeah. You can't just go in and sort of graze over it. They're going to be like, ah, excuse me, yeah. how about this, this, and we this, We had and a this. moment on the podcast the <laughs> other day where uh, Ari Wasserman and I were, were – and Ari went to Arizona, so I blame yeah. him more than I blame myself. But we're like, who was that quarterback at Arizona when they made the Fiesta Bowl in, in 2014? And I know – Everybody listening is going is screaming at their car radio. Anu Solomon, yeah. <laughs> how do you idiots not know this? And we got you guys too many get names it, in our head. You guys get it times a million uh, on yeah. TV. Yeah, and and you know what I always say about that is um, I never blame the mean tweets because I always think. I mean, unless it's something you like, you know, same you're thing fat you or something. <laughs> but but to me, I'm like, I, I need to know that. Yeah. Like, that is on me for making that mistake. I, I will always own those mistakes and, and try to avoid them at all costs. Yeah, see, if I, if I had a job in TV, I would never read Twitter. Because it's bad it's enough when, when, when people are critiquing what I wear on, on the video version of the podcast. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't need that. And you're a dapper guy. Come on. Well, what are you doing? People, I, take a, I, I take a chance every once in a while, and you know, people don't like I it when know. you take chances. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. It, you, you notice I really wear solid color all the time and nothing is really that off the wall you because I, I've learned hey I know what I'm gonna get hate for and oh I yeah. don't really want the hate I, I know I'm gonna get hate no matter what but if I can avoid some of it I will <laughs> I'm thinking <laughs> you know I, I like today I pull out the jacket because we're, we're here at SEC media days yeah. for those who don't know the room where all the stuff is going on is being kept at about 36 degrees it is so cold i think it's for you guys on i TV. actually i gotta tell you i have never i've done a lot of cold weather games and things of that yeah. nature i was shivering <laughs> on the set as we're waiting for saving to come on uh, up on the set i'm thinking i can't even talk because yeah. it is so cold over there i don't know what's going on down there but I, i'm an icicle and yeah. and tomorrow i will be showing up but, in a parka but that's but why i'm wearing the jacket now because I, I i think i'm turning into either steve jobs or homer simpson <laughs> <laughs> where, I, like, at home, I just wear the same T-shirt and shorts oh, yeah, me every too. day. I, yeah. I, I have a uniform. The it's pandemic like a, turned me yeah, into that. Totally. So I, If I could, I would never wear anything except sweatpants and, and a T-shirt, which I think most people feel that way. But I, it's really annoying when you have to actually Before dress up. Before Emmanuel Acho left for Fox, he was trying to get the athleisure onto nice. ESPN. Yeah. He was trying to break down some barriers. So I'm, I'm waiting. It's funny you mentioned Get Up because I always, when that show initially started, that you could never figure out what the dress code was because each, oh, yeah. each person would oh, have yeah, their own kind of dress neither. code. Oh, yeah, we couldn't either. But now it seems like if everybody's figured it out, okay, Green yeah. wears a jacket with no tie, so right. it that's sort of the, the baseline, and then we're all yes. going to work off of that. Yes. But – it, it, oh yeah, early on. I mean, there were some sweatshirts on there. Oh, yeah. it, it was it was wild and crazy. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, and somebody would come in like a three piece suit. Yeah, it's <laughs> you're right. <laughs> but I'm telling. Yeah, I, listen. I, I know those ESPN execs have been banging down my door for years. But <laughs> if if I am ever to say yes, <laughs> we would gonna, love to have. It's going to be all athleisure. Oh, I'm I can't. Sorry. Okay, okay, good. Well, I'll let them know that that that's what they're. Oh gonna yeah, get from no, you. I I will be. They're going to get great reporting and great writing and athleisure. Oh, exactly. Yeah. I will be the one. You know, organizing the rest of the company like Love we it. are revolting against the, the yes, formal wear. Yes, you will. You will create an entire revolt, and I'll, I'll be right there with you, side oh, by side. Cannot wait. No, I mean it's been fun doing this, and I'll do this for a little while. But I will launch the uh, the the ESPN Lululemon revolution. <laughs> it's coming. Laura Rutledge, <laughs> thank you so much for the time. Thank you. So